Well, it's a, it's a very great honor for me to be here. And uh, all I can say from the ceremony, there should be many more heads of universities who are women. <laughs> uh, because embrace is usually more spiritual. <laughs> but I think in the present scene, it was very practical <laughs> and very much enjoyed. <laughs> and I thank you. And of course, if there are women professors, uh, if you wish to enjoy in the embrace, we can make time after it. <laughs> I should say, I was asked to write a speech, but I never write a speech, because it commits you in advance. And of course, now that I've heard all the formal speeches, I realize my speech, if I had written it, would be extremely boring. <laughs> you know, it would just say all the usual things that people say at these ceremonies. Now, usually, when I get an honorary degree, it is at a normal graduation ceremony. And they sit in the audience, many young people getting their degrees in medicine or biology or even humanities. They then, I then have to sit through the entire process of shaking the hands and so on. And then I'm allowed to speak. And of course, what I say then is very different from what I say now. Because all these people have worked some three years, some four years, some many more years, night and day, written examinations to receive a diploma. But here I get one, I didn't do anything. <laughs> I just got it free, and uh, it's usually very high up in the ranks of degrees. Uh, of course, it's a little bit of, a, of a, uh, uh, an exaggeration, because to get into that ex position, you have to work quite hard in all of your life. Uh, I've always been interested in the science of solving problems because that's what science is. It is the best way we know of giving answers to problems. I remember once I spoke to a politician in England as you know, many politicians are only interested in one objective, which is to be re-elected. <laughs> that means they have short-term objectives of maybe two, maybe three years. Uh, scientists are interested in much more long-term things. This uh, junior minister was uh, criticizing me because I was living, as he said, in an ivory tower, not doing anything for the good of the society or the economy, which is very important these days. So I said to him, I said, have you ever solved a problem in your life? <laughs> he said, what do you mean? I said, I mean, there's been a problem. No solution has been found, and you found the solution. He said, come to think of it, I haven't done that. I said, that's what we do here. <laughs> we solve problems. Because I think, you know, history of humanity can be summed up in very few words. Okay, and what we've learned two things, a number of things. But what we have learned is that magic doesn't work. Religion is very unreliable. 
but science works. And that's the important thing. It's only a few hundred years old that we discovered it. And what science does and can do is to challenge the doctrines that go around. And research to accomplish novel things is our way of showing that we can give the answers to new problems. I could say much about what has been said before, but I must tell you the story, how I came to see that there was a difference between junk and garbage. All right? Uh, one day, a machine was delivered to our lab from California in a beautiful box. The box was open, and so I took the box home. And I said to my wife, you know, I'm going to build a bookcase with this box. Uh, this box stayed in the house for many years. It migrated up to our attic. And one day, my wife uh, said to me, uh, she needed to clear the attic. So she threw the box out. See? And I said, where's my box? She said, you will never build a box. I know you. And I threw it out because now you can go and buy yourself a bookcase. So my wife was a terrific agent of natural selection. <laughs> See, she instantly converted junk into garbage and threw it out, you see? Now, of course, there's one difference between natural junk and garbage. One was I had a plan to build this, but biological systems cannot plan for the future. Uh, the bacterium sitting in the primitive ocean can't say, oh, I better not touch this gene because I may need it in three billion years to make a muscle. Can't say that. So, junk is kept because there's no reason to throw it out. Because most of the junk doesn't damage you. So there's no Darwinian move to make it important. And the other thing you learn, if I can say it, which I think many people don't appreciate, is that there is a difference between the three, between three disciplines. Only mathematics is the art of the perfect. Only mathematics. Physics is the art of the optimal. <laughs> but biology is the art of the satisfactory. If it works, keep it. <laughs> Even though, because, to try and improve it costs, costs sequence value. You have to invent new sequences, and it's very expensive in evolution. So the best thing is to cut corners, just keep it. And the other thing I know about evolution is that many things seem impossible to do in evolution. In fact, the whole program, initial program, I should say, of systems biology, that everything was calculable, is wrong. It's wrong. You know why? Because biology treats evolution like income tax. As you know, if you evade paying income tax, you go to jail. It's a criminal offense. But you can legally avoid paying income tax. That's the way out. And biology finds tricks to avoid all these catastrophes of too many equations. It just finds a different way to do it. Uh, usually very cheap. So for all of you who are studying evolution, and I know that Barcelona is a great center for this. 
just trying to remember that E. coli is extremely stupid. <laughs> it cannot do complicated things. All it knows is how to avoid income tax. <laughs> the, the perils of evolution. I will say one last thing. Uh, one of my speakers said he regrets that they haven't, I haven't written more or worked on evolution. I've been working on evolution for the last 15 years. It's only very recently that I've seen a way out of the, of the main problems of this. Now, of course, he will still have to wait because I am a very reluctant writer. I don't have Francis Crick anymore to lock me in a room and say, you're not coming out till you've written that paper. <laughs> but I will be writing soon. And I hope, I hope this is, uh, will be, you don't have to wait for another Sidney Branagh. <laughs> he exists already. You may have to wait for another writer in the name of Sidney Branagh. Well, all I can say finally is why it is important to lodge all these things in universities. Because now that we know apparently so much about humans, we now recognize how little we know. And as I mentioned before, humans are the most important animals on this planet. Uh, we are the only animal that can think about the future. That is, we can remember the future, if you like. All animals remember the past, but we can actually envisage what the future will be. That's the basis of science, after all. We live in a society now where everything is driven to economic value. Uh, most of it in the form of money. But there's many more things that we have to ensure. We have to ensure that humans are seen much more as just genomes walking around in bodies. See, uh, once I gave a lecture to an audience and someone in the audience stood up and said, why can't I copy myself, clone myself, and keep the copies for spare parts? My reply was, be careful. One of the copies might keep you for spare parts. <laughs> you see, he did not recognize that these copies were persons that had minds and capacities of their own. We should not forget that. We should not forget that we still have to do new things in the future. And short-termism is something that the university can counteract because you are in charge, not of today's economy, but you're in charge of the economy 20 years from now. Why? Because the people you will educate, the people you will, you will influence, will be the people that will create the economy of the future. And we must preserve that at all costs. That is the function of the university. It should not just become a kind of research institute, but you should encourage the broad education of your young people, as well as offering them challenges uh, that will measure them, or measure, allow them to measure themselves. So I wish you all a great future, and uh, I thank you for the honorary degree and for the nice medal 
and for the embrace. <laughs> Thank you.